right. Uh, so I'm filling in kind of last minute today. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about antidepressant toxicity. Uh, normally, the full version of this lecture is an hour, so I, I can't cover all the things that are in this PowerPoint. Uh, but I'll be talking about uh, some uh, types of poisoning that we don't see very often, but are really important to know about because they're they're really severe. Uh, so monoamine oxidase inhibitor toxicity, uh, tricyclic antidepressant toxicity, and then something we see pretty commonly, SSRI overdose, uh, that usually is not as serious. Uh, I'll see if we have time, I'll, I'll try to get to bupropion, although I know there's been a lot of talk about that lately with, uh, I think there's been at least a morning report on it. Uh, and we definitely won't get to mood stabilizers today. Uh, so let's start with MAOIs, uh, and these have been around for a long time. Uh, they've been around since the early 50s, uh, and there was a drug called ipronizid, which was an anti-tubercular uh, medication, and nurses on TB wards noticed that TB patients that were being treated with ipronizid were less depressed, and uh, that was what led to its being used as an antidepressant, and it was actually the first one that, uh, that was on the market. Um, these have were mostly replaced by what was at the time considered safer tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, and now they're very limited role, although they're definitely still used. Um, so uh, uh, ipronizid is the structure on the left. Uh, phenylzine, which is an MAOI that's still on the market, uh, is on the right. And one thing that's important when we're dealing with these psychiatric medications is I think people have a tendency to think, oh, if I haven't heard of it, it must not be that bad. Right, because surely I would have heard of it if it was one of the things I have to worry about, and that's a bias there. Uh, you have to be really careful about that because you know sometimes you may know the generic and not the brand name, or vice versa. Uh, so when you see a patient on a bunch of psychiatric medications, it's just important to look them up and see what class of uh, drugs that you're dealing with. So the basic mechanism of MAO inhibitors is that normally when you release a neurotransmitter into the synapse, it's taken back up into the presynaptic neuron. And then uh, some of it gets repackaged into synaptic vesicles, but some of it is in the cytoplasm of that presynaptic neuron is broken down by monoamine oxidase. Uh, so if you inhibit that monoamine oxidase, there is more neurotransmitter that's around to be packaged into your, your synaptic vesicles. And so each time you release them, you're releasing more neurotransmitter. So there's two types of MAO. There is the brain and the gut. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, of the MAO inhibitors are selective and some are not selective. Um, and some of them wind up, uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit about why that's important uh, when we talk about how the, there are certain drug food interactions that we have to worry about. So in overdose, the toxicity of uh, MAOIs, you can see hypertension, tachycardia, nephriasis, agitation, diaphoresis. So a lot of this sounds like your sympathomimetic toxiform, right? It's just like a lot of catecholamine stuff. Um, but then you can have uh, delayed effects that you can see cardiovascular collapse and neurologic collapse that it's not really clear why this happens, but it can happen quite a bit later, even like a day after the overdose. Um, and it, it may be related to catecholamine depletion, but for whatever reason, you can see these delayed effects. Uh, one thing that can be a clue on exam, if you don't have a history of what the patient actually took is what's uh, described as ping pong gaze. Uh, and so this is described in, uh, in this paper. Uh, the patient's eyes deviated horizontally from extreme right lateral to extreme left lateral gaze every three to four seconds without pause or nystagmus. And then there's another description. Uh, so just picture someone sitting at the side of a ping pong table watching the game, right? Uh, so just every few seconds, they're going to be looking up to either side. Uh, do you guys know what these foods and drinks have in common and what their relation is here? Yeah, so tyramine crisis. So these are all foods rich in tyramine, uh, which is in a lot of aged uh, and fermented things. So uh, ferment, aged cheeses, uh, beer, soy sauce, aged meats, uh, kind of all the things that are wonderful in life. Uh, these are things that you can't eat if you're uh, on an MAOI. Uh, and what happens is, what's that? <laughs> Um, yeah, that would make you more depressed. Today. <laughs> That's true. Um, so the normally all, all of these foods contain tyramine, and normally that tyramine, when you eat those foods, it doesn't cause a problem because the MAO that's in your gut breaks down the tyramine, 
Um, but if you inhibit the MAO in the gut, then you wind up absorbing it. And tyramine basically acts like an amphetamine. Uh, so what, that, what does that mean? It gets taken up by the same reuptake channel that, that uh, our catecholamine neurotransmitters are taken up by. Uh, and when they get into the presynaptic neuron, they go into the synaptic vesicle and they make it more permeable and leaky. And the neurotransmitter leaks out of the vessel, vesicle into the cytoplasm. Uh, and that winds up causing uh, indirect release into the synapse. Uh, and so you get uh, uh, basically like a, ca a catecholamine-like effect, and it's, it's the same basic mechanism as amphetamines. Um, so this basically leads to a hypertensive crisis. Um, so you see a big elevation in blood pressure. You can also see this without tyramine, but with other drugs that, that act in a similar way. So amphetamines, cocaine, methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, um, and uh, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine. Uh, so all of these interact with uh, MAOIs to cause this hypertensive crisis. So when you see a patient with uh, an MAO ingestion, uh, you need to do aggressive supportive care. There's no antidote to MAOIs, um, but think about intubating early um, and just uh, uh, recognize that these patients may have delayed effects. So even if they look well early, that doesn't mean they need to be intubated right away if they're not sick yet. But these are patients that even if they look well, can't go home. Um, the, you know, even if they, it, there's no period of observation that would be reasonable in the emergency department where you'd be able to send these patients home. So they all get admitted. Um, think about GI decontamination early uh, because th this is uh, definitely a drug that, that could, can be a killer. Uh, and this is also for pediatrics, it's on the one pill killer list. So you should be concerned, even one pill in a, in a pediatric ingestion is gonna be serious. Um, and, and then it's just good supportive care. Um, managing fluids and electrolytes, if patients are hyperthermic, cool them. Um, if patients are having a hypertensive crisis, a good choice is an alpha blocker, uh, like phentolamine, uh, to cause vasodilation. Uh, and again, all, all patients get admitted. Uh, anyone recognize this, this Netter diagram, what uh, clinical entity this is describing related to MAYs? Serotonin syndrome right here in front. Yeah, so this is like really classic. It's one of our uh, neuromuscular rigidity hyperthermia syndromes uh, and uh, you know, distinguished from NMS in a number of ways. One in that the underlying pathophysiology is an excess of serotonin rather than an uh, inadequate dopamine. Um, but uh, the things that you can use to distinguish it also is that it's a much more rapid onset, typically over hours. Uh, unlike NMS, which happens much more slowly, uh, tends to affect the lower extremities more than the upper extremities. Uh, hyperreflexia and clonus are really prominent uh, and having gastrointestinal effects like diarrhea is, is another, another classic uh, feature. So uh, MAOIs uh, are frequently implicated in, in uh, causing serotonin syndrome. It, uh, there's a lot of interactions with other serotonergic drugs, uh, and these are really important ones to know about. Uh, so our SSRIs, uh, but some things that we don't necessarily think of as being serotonergic, right? Meperidine, dextromethorphan, lithium, spirone, uh, all of our amphetamines, cocaine. Uh, this is an important interaction. It's actually directly responsible for uh, limitations on your work hours. Uh, and I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the Libby Zion case, but uh, uh, she was a patient who was uh, on uh, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and uh, what also had used cocaine that night. So that also potentially uh, could have uh, contributed, uh, but she wound up going to an emergency department and was treated with meperidine for pain uh, by an unsupervised intern uh, at that time and wound up uh, ultimately dying of serotonin syndrome. And uh, her, her father was a, a prominent a reporter uh, for, for the New York Times. And uh, this turned into a, a big case that wound up leading to restrictions on resident work hours and regulations about supervisions of, re of residents. Uh, so it made a lot of changes in the medical uh, system, actually, the, this one particular drug interaction. So that's one you should definitely know about. Uh, things that you can see with serotonin syndrome, you can see metabolic acidosis, you can see elevated CPK, um, elevation in your liver and, and renal enzymes, uh, and, uh, and DIC. 
Uh, and these are kind of all indirectly from the hypothermia and the muscle rigidity. Uh, treatment, benzodiazepines are really the first line. Uh, there is a serotonin antagonist, ciproheptidine uh, or periactin uh, that's used as an appetite stimul uh, stimulant. Uh, and some people have advocated for the use of this. The, the evidence is not really strong. There's no real studies on it. There's like case reports about it. Um, it sort of makes sense. Uh, and there's probably not much downside, so it's reasonable. Uh, but you know, it's if you omitted that, it, it wouldn't be wrong because there's, like I said, not a lot of evidence for it. Um, it. It's also only available in a tablet form, so there's no IV form. The patient needs to be able to either take by mouth or you'd have to put it down a orogastric or nasogastric tube. Uh, dentroline is really not the right treatment for this. It's to treat a different entity, another uh, a rigidity hypothermia syndrome. Uh, malignant hyperthermia. Uh, although people kind of confuse these syndromes a lot and dentroline gets used for a lot of things other than that, but it's, it's really not designed for treating this and there's not good evidence behind it. Uh, so I, I, this is the article about the uh, Libby Zion case that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so back in 1995. So any questions about that before I go on to the TCAs? So TCAs uh, or tricyclic antidepressants, I think uh, from looking at these structures, you can guess how they got their names, um, right? They all have these three rings, uh, two six-membered aromatic rings with a seven-membered ring in between. And uh, again, this is another one where a lot of these you're gonna recognize, right? Uh, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, but you might not recognize some of the brand names. So just again, be really careful about looking up those drugs that you don't recognize when you see them on a patient's med list. So TCAs are, are what's called pharmacologically promiscuous, meaning they interact with a lot of different types of channels and receptors. Uh, so their therapeutic effect is through inhibition of reuptake of norepi and serotonin. Um, and then they do a whole bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with how they work therapeutically. So they're anti-muscarinic. So this is, and, and of all the anti-muscarinic drugs, these are the ones that you need to identify when you see a patient who comes in looking anticholinergic, uh, this is the one that's gonna kill you. So when you think about uh, your anticholinergic patient, your first question you should ask yourself is, could this be a TCA? Um, they're sodium channel blockers. Uh, they're, they're Von Williams uh, 1C sodium channel blockers. So they cause prolongation of your QRS interval. Uh, they're anti-GABA, which is what leads to seizures. They're alpha blockers, so they cause peripheral vasodilation and hypotension, uh, and they're antihistamines. Uh, so you know they 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 have their therapeutic effect on on uh, serotonin and on norepi, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg of all the different types of things that they interact with. Uh, their most important uh, effects are really their uh, from a toxicologic perspective is their effects on the heart and the brain. So the the sodium channel blockade. Uh, is what leads to your QRS prolongation, right? They, they block that fast sodium influx so that steep part of your cardiac action potential gets flattened out. And on the surface EKG, what that looks like is QRS widening. Um, you can also see what's called the terminal 40 millisecond right axis. Uh, so the last 40 milliseconds or the last little box of your QRS complex uh, is gonna have a rightward axis. So it can lead ADR, which is normally just a downward deflection uh, you're going to see that upward deflection at the end of the complex. Uh, and this is very sensitive, not really specific, um, but the absence of that pretty much precludes significant tricyclic toxicity. If you see that, the patient may just be taking a tricyclic. Uh, it may just be their, heart, their, their inherent conduction abnormality. Uh, but if you don't see that, it's a pretty good sign that the patient isn't tricyclic poisoned. Um, there, there's uh, studies looking at the height of the R wave in AVR as a predictor of toxicity, but I think really the best uh, predictor of toxicity and the easiest to remember is looking at the QRS interval itself. Um, so this is an electrocardiogram showing a lot of tricyclic effects. It shows your tachycardia, that's the anti-muscarinic effect. It shows your widened QRS, which is a sodium channel blocker effect and your terminal 40 millisecond right axis, that tall R wave at the end of the QRS in lead AVR. So uh, this study from Bonner and Lovejoy uh, looked at uh, the QRS interval as a predictor of tricyclic toxicity. And they found that actually the QRS duration is a better predictor of toxicity than even tricyclic antidepressant serum concentrations. 
um, because you're directly measuring the effect of the drug. Right, so if your QRS is under 100 milliseconds, then the person didn't really take enough tricyclic to hurt themselves. If the QRS is over 100 milliseconds, then you have a one in three risk of seizure. And a QRS of over 160 milliseconds is a one in two risk of dysrhythmia. Uh, so uh, interestingly, the, even though the, the risk of seizure is well predicted by the QRS interval, the seizures are not caused by the sodium channel blockade. The seizures are caused by an anti-GABA effect in the brain. Uh, but if you have enough tricyclic around to block those sodium channels and prolong your QRS, then you have enough in the brain to cause a seizure. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is for ACLS, what's a normal QRS interval? Up to 120, right? So this is kind of interesting, right? So what would be a normal QRS interval by ACLS, right? If you have a QRS of 110, you're already at risk of seizures after a tricyclic overdose. But for ACLS would say that's normal. How do you reconcile that? Why, what, why do you think that patients with a what would be a normal QRS or, or at risk in this setting? This is the study, yeah, Bonner and Lovejoy, yeah. But I think the, the thing to recognize is that they are different patient populations, right? ACLS is for old people with sick hearts, right? And so in that patient population, there's a lot of people with intrinsic conduction delays. And so you'll find a, a, a lot more people with wider QRSs. But if you look at a group of young, healthy people, a normal QRS is a lot closer to 80 than it is to 100. And so people who, who are, are an overdose population are much more likely to be young, healthy people. Uh, so that's really the difference uh, in, in why this, this uh, discrepancy in what is a normal QRS in this setting is because of that different population that we're dealing with. So as I said, the TCA uh, mediated seizures of cause of binding to the picrotoxin binding site in the GABA channel. Uh, and so they're, they're basically, when you block GABA, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, and a lack of that inhibition leads to excitation and seizures. So treating the QRS interval actually doesn't prevent seizures. You need to treat the seizures directly and we'll talk about that in a sec. So in terms of treatment, airway, breathing and circulation, these patients will, generally be really sick really quickly. Um, patients with, with tricyclic poisoning, if they're going to die of it, they typically die within six hours of ingestion and they're really sick within a couple hours of ingestion. Uh, so you know, if they're looking sick when they come in, just think about intubation early, uh, especially if they, they have a wide QRS already. Uh, th these are patients that are you know, really critically ill. Uh, think about GI decontamination early if you can manage to do it and not interfere with the other things that you need to do. Um, and remember that treating the QRS interval is, doesn't treat the seizures. So if you have a patient with seizures, you need to give them benzos. Uh, and the treatment for the, the widened QRS, the sodium channel blockade, is giving sodium bicarbonate. Uh, and this works two different ways. Uh, so when you give a bolus of sodium bicarbonate, uh, typically, you'll use one to two milliequivalents per kilo, uh, and it's important that you run your EKG uh, at rhythm strip while you're doing it. Think about it like as like if you were pushing adenosine or something. You if you just give the bicarb and then order an EKG and then try to find the tech and have them do the EKG. By the time that's done, you're going to miss the narrowing of the QRS that you would get from the the bicarb bolus. Uh, so you really need to run the rhythm strip, push the sodium bicarb, and in real time watch the QRS narrow. Um, so when you, when you give it as a bolus like that, you're relying on a lot of sodium getting to the heart at once and overcoming the sodium channel blockade, right? Because our bicarb is 8.4% sodium bicarb. That's hypertonic. Uh, and you're getting a lot of sodium getting to the heart at once. Now, if you do see QRS narrowing, when you push the, the sodium bicarb, you're going to start an infusion and you tip, most people will use a recipe that's similar for what we use for alkalinization for other purposes. So you put like three amps of bicarb in a liter of D5W and run it at twice maintenance. And then you're not really getting that hypertonic sodium getting to the heart. And you're actually relying on a pH effect when you start an infusion. Um, and it's not to enhance elimination of the drug, but it relies on the fact that at higher pH, the affinity for the, of the tricyclic for the sodium channel is lower. Uh, so when you give a bolus, you get both of those effects. You get all the sodium and you get the pH effect of a lower affinity of the drug for the channel. When you start the infusion, uh, you only really get that pH effect. Uh, you know, ideally, if you had unlimited resources, you'd have someone sit at the bedside and every time the QRS started to get wide, you give a, a 
bolus, uh, but that's not really practical. And so typically the infusion is what gets started. Uh, remember that these drugs are also alpha blockers and you can see peripheral vasodilation and hypotension for that reason. Uh, and so you, you often will need to give a vasopressor as well. Uh, a kind of last resort, if somebody is coding, you can think about intralipid or lipid rescue therapy, kind of providing a, a lipid compartment in the blood for a lipid soluble drug to go into other than to its site of toxicity, which in this case is the heart and brain. One thing you don't want to do is give physostigmine. So people might get tempted to do that because they see the anti-muscarinic effect, uh, but physostigmine is definitely contraindicated in these patients. Um, and it, physostigmine used to be given a lot more liberally for uh, patients who had altered mental status or, or mental status depression. In fact, the, the brand name of physostigmine is anti-lurium, kind of anti-delirium. Uh, and it, because it's an analeptic, it wakes people up like coffee, kind of, it, it's, it's a nonspecific analeptic. And then there were case reports of a number of patients who were tricyclic poisoned and got physostigmine and went into asystole. People kind of got afraid to use it at all. But really the right lesson about that is don't give physostigmine to patients who are tricyclic poisoned. And part of the reason for that is if you think about what contributes to your blood pressure, right? It's your cardiac output times your peripheral vascular resistance and your cardiac output is your heart rate times your stroke volume. So if your peripheral vascular resistance is shot because you have alpha blockade, uh, and you don't have good squeeze because of the sodium channel blockade. The only thing that's really maintaining your blood pressure at all is the tachycardia from your anti-muscarinic effect. And if you take that away from the patient, that uh, by giving them uh, uh, physostigmine, it's not surprising that they decompensate and get asystole. Any questions about tricyclics before I go on to SSRIs? Yeah. For some reason, like, You could, but that's really, uh, you know, I, I think I would never use it as a replacement. Uh, you should always be able to find bicarb. Um, yeah, I can't think of a situation where you'd have hypertonic saline available and not bicarb. The only time I've considered doing what you're, uh, if for people in the back who didn't hear, uh, Dr. Warshaw was asking whether you could use hypertonic saline boluses instead of bicarb uh, in the, if for some reason you didn't have bicarb. Uh, and the only time I've considered that is in a patient who was really sick and getting a ton of bicarb and their pH was getting too high where people didn't feel comfortable to continue to give bicarb, but their QRS was still getting wide. Uh, that's somebody that's in a bad situation. Uh, maybe you could consider it in that setting. I think that would be more likely than that you didn't have bicarb available, but, uh, but it's not really studied. Okay, so SSRIs, there is a ton of them out there. Uh, I think these we're probably more familiar with because there's so many more people on them these days. So uh, we're more likely to be familiar with some of the, the brand names and uh, as well as the, the uh, generics. Uh, you notice I have two of them with an asterisk there, uh, citalopram and escitalopram, uh, because these are really different from the other SSRIs uh, in that they have uh, another effect uh, on, the, on the heart that has nothing to do with their therapeutic effect. Uh, and unfortunately, those are some of the more popular ones that, that people are on these days. Uh, so unlike the tricyclic antidepressants, which inhibit reuptake of, of uh, norepi and serotonin, these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they only inhibit reuptake of serotonin and, and not norepi. Uh, and it, most of the time, these overdoses are relatively benign, right? I mean, I think we see a fair number of these. And when you get a patient who comes in with an SSRI overdose, this is kind of what they look like, right? They're just like really drowsy. Uh, most of the time you just see some mental status depression and they just need to be observed. Uh, and you know, it's, it's once they're kind of more awake, uh, they, they can generally be cleared for psych. Um, you, things that you can see that you do have to worry about, uh, potentially you can run into problems with serotonin syndrome. Uh, especially in combination with other serotonergic drugs, but you can see it just from an overdose of, of uh, an SSRI, uh, although it's not common. Um, now, if the patient is on citalopram or escitalopram, these are drugs that uh, uh, block potassium channels and cause QT prolongation, and they can, that can lead to torsade de quin. Uh, so that's what's really fundamentally different. Lexapro and Celexa, citalopram and escitalopram. Uh, when you see patients on these, uh, 
always get a screening EKG, but even if the screening EKG is normal, they all need 24 hours of observation on a monitor because uh, they're, they can have normal initial EKGs with a normal QT interval. Uh, and there's case reports of people going into torsades 18 hours post ingestion with a normal initial EKG. Uh, so you can have delayed uh, QT prolongation in these patients. Another thing that you can see, uh, and this is kind of more of an idiosyncratic effect, not really dose related, although within, indiv within an individual patient, it may be dose related, uh, but you can see SIADH, uh, and this especially happens with paroxetine or Paxil. Uh, elderly patients are more susceptible to this. Uh, and just, you know, when, when you see these patients, I, I think typically we're gonna get labs on our, on our overdose patients anyway, um, because we're gonna be thinking about getting them for screening uh, for, for psychiatry. Uh, but uh, looking at that serum sodium is gonna be important because SIADH is potentially going to be an adverse effect of these. And then you do your workup for SIADH if you see the patient uh, had, does have a low sodium. Uh, and then really the treatment is just the same as other forms of SIDH. It's going to be fluid restriction and you just need to discontinue the drug. They can't continue on it. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about bupropion, uh, which is marketed uh, by several brand names, right? There's Wellbutrin is the antidepressant, uh, but then there's Zyban for smoking cessation. It's the same drug. It's just different FDA indications. Uh, and bupropion is a unicyclic antidepressant. It's basically an amphetamine, right? So amphetamine, you can see on the right and bupropion on the left. Uh, in general, uh, all amphetamines are what's called phenylethylamines, meaning they have a ring carbon, carbon, nitrogen, and anything with like ring carbon, carbon, nitrogen is gonna have amphetamine-like effects. And bupropion has that basic structure. Uh, I guess I, I should say it's more uh, actually like, like a cathinone or a bath salt. Uh, because it has that, that ketone right next to the ring, that double bond O, uh, that's really similar to the structure of, of, uh, of methedrone, which is what's in bath salts, the, the kind of uh, amphetamine-like compounds. Uh, so patients, are, it's not surprising that their mood is elevated. We're giving them amphetamines, essentially, when, uh, when they're, they're taking bupropion. Um, so this is indicated for depression and smoking cessation. It inhibits uh, both norepi uh, reuptake and dopamine reuptake. Uh, and there's two important adverse effects from bupropion. Uh, there's the, uh, again, effects on the heart and effects on the brain. Um, so in terms of the effects on the brain is seizures. Um, and this can even happen with therapeutic dosing, uh, but really reliably happens in any significant overdose. Um, and uh, remember that this can be delayed when patients take the sustained release preparation, which is what almost everybody is on at this point. Uh, and it's not due to the parent compound, it's due to a metabolite called hydroxypropion. So in addition to the, the delayed release, there's also the metabolism that has to occur before the patient gets, uh, gets the seizures. The cardiac effects, you can see a widened QRS and you can get dysrhythmias from bupropion, but these tend not to respond to bicarb. I mean, it's reasonable to try it, but they're not mediated by sodium channel blockade. They're actually uh, through a different mechanism called gap junction inhibition. Uh, so it really, it, it doesn't have anything to do with sodium channel. So it's not surprising that, that sodium bicarb doesn't really work. Um, but it is usually reasonable to try it. Uh, I guess if the patient responded, maybe they took something that they didn't say that they did. Uh, but if it did respond, then it would be reasonable to start an infusion. Uh, and when you see a patient with a bupropion overdose, you should be really worried. Uh, these are things that really kill a lot of people. It's one of the, the leading causes of poisoning death in the US uh, from pharmaceuticals. Um, so think about GI decontamination aggressively early. Um, so, uh, you know, if you can do lavage, if they come in early enough, think about it. Uh, although the, the sustained release pills don't really fit well up the, the lavage tube, you may get pill fragments. Uh, but definitely think about whole bowel irrigation, think about multi dose activated charcoal, um, and just anything that you can do to prevent absorption of this drug. Because when, if the person gets too much, there's probably nothing you can do for them. They're, it's just a very lethal drug to, to overdose on. Um, you can give benzos for the seizures, uh, think about intubating early uh, and uh, an EEG monitoring if you wind up doing that. Uh, and 
really think about transferring early for ECMO. Uh, that's that's one thing that potentially, if or if you're in an ECMO center, getting them on ECMO is something that could potentially bridge them until they have metabolized the drug, uh, and that that may be the one thing that that can save them. Um, it's it's unfortunate we don't have that available here. We did have it at Downstate for a while, but um, we haven't had it for some time now. Um, now there was a case in CCT. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and the team did everything right. Super aggressive GID contamination. Uh, they, you know, thought about intralipid as, as another thing that you can think about for, you know, as a last ditch effort uh, for if somebody is really crashing. Uh, but they did manage to get the patient to the ICU, but the patient wound up dying uh, the next day, I think. All right. So, any questions about any of that? I don't up to the mood stabilizer part, which I don't think we really have time to do. So I'm gonna skip this part and I will end on time. <laughs> All right, well, thank you uh, for giving me the chance to fill in for your empty slot today. <laughs>